we can't make change in our lives doing the same thing that we've always done. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on tarot and astrology, how to use them together for spiritual self-growth. So we talk about topics like shadow work, how to strengthen your intuition, how to ask better questions in tarot, and more. Our guest today is Stephanie Caponi. Stephanie Caponi is the best-selling author of Guided Tarot, Guided Tarot for Teens, Guided Astrology, and the creator of three editions of the Moon Void Tarot. She has been reading tarot for over 20 years and established her business as a professional tarot reader and astrologer after creating her first tarot deck in 2018. Her passion for astrology led her to write the monthly horoscopes for Dame, which focus on sex, intimacy, and relationships. Stephanie's work is centered around guiding her clients on their personal journeys of healing, up-leveling, and creating their dream lives using both tarot and astrology as their unique roadmap of cosmic guidance. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling? I'm feeling amazing, Eileen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Good. I'm excited to have you. Um, So why don't you start by telling us your story? What drew you to tarot and to astrology? And I want to know which was your first love. Ooh, so tarot was my first love. I discovered tarot when I was about 14 and I was in high school and wanted to be a little witch. (laughs) Um, I went to Catholic school, so I kind of kept it really on the down low. Um, And obviously there I'm a little older, so the internet wasn't really a thing at that time. So the resources for tarot were very, very limited and very obscure. And it really wasn't until um, 2016 when I went through like a huge spiritual awakening and my whole life kind of crashed all at the same time. And I found myself really without support like from my family and my friends. Um, I was going through a divorce and and nobody understood why. They were like, you guys were the happiest couple. You were together for, you know, 14 years. Like what happened? And I, I didn't know. It just, everything felt wrong and I just needed to like escape. And that's when I really turned deeply to tarot to kind of be my support system through that whole process which ended up being not just leaving a marriage. I quit my jobs. I had two very like amazing lucrative jobs. I left my house. In what industries? I'm curious. Oh, so I was working as a hairdresser and I've always been an artist. Yeah. And I had a client who, who was working for an interior design magazine. And she was like, oh, you're an artist. We're looking for a watercolor illustrator. And so I was working for the magazine, doing watercolor pen and ink drawings for several years, plus keeping my day job at the salon. And it's just, none of it was quite right. And I didn't, I just, everything was wrong. So I gave away everything I owned. Left it's like my a refresh. Job. That's a huge, yes. <laughs> like you just reset your life completely. Uh huh. It was absolutely like a tower moment, you know, like the tower tarot card. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I had no idea why. And I just packed up what I could into my car and drove to New York with no plan, no job lined up. Um, I rented a room and just was like, oh, what am I going to do with my life now? And again, I was very deeply into tarot and into journaling. And that's also when I, had my first professional astrology reading. And I must have listened to that recording that she sent me hundreds of times. And I started to teach myself how to read astrology based on how she did that. Because I was like, I need to know the transits, like what happened here? And I found out that Uranus hit my seventh house and opposed my ascendant. And I was like, boom, if it's not working, you're done. But I also, at that time, started creating a tarot deck, my first tarot deck, the Moon Void Tarot. And it was just based on like drawings of myself kind of going through the fool's journey, just kind of to like help me process what I had just done to my life. 
And I had no intention of selling it or becoming a professional tarot reader. But it was like all these synchronistic events started happening at the same time. You know, I found myself in a tarot community and studying it with other people, which I, you know, it had always been such a private thing. And then people started reaching out and asking, well, what are you going to do with this tarot deck? I saw you post your drawings on Instagram. And I was like, I don't know. It's just for fun. It's kind of helping me heal and do some shadow work and like figure out like how I got so off course. And, you know, a friend was like, well, I'm a graphic designer and I could help you lay that all out. And I could hook you up with a printer. And I was like, who's going to buy this deck? It's like a million like pictures of me. (laughs) (laughs) And, and more and more people started asking me for readings. People were interested in the deck. And I, um, in 2018, decided to do like a small printing. I was like, I'll just throw it out on Instagram and see if anybody, I'm going to order a hundred decks, see if I can raise the money to do that. And I sold them all out so fast. Amazing. And it just, it kind of became my, my whole career. Wow. I love how it was like unexpected. Like it, it was not intentional. It just happened that way. But at the same time, you happen to be an artist already. You've happened to be into tarot for many years and it just like, it kind of led you that way, right? It really taught me a lot about, I mean, the whole process taught me about like not living your life for other people and their expectations of you and really what you think life is supposed to aesthetically look like. Is that how you're describing your previous self? Like that's how you lived your life? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want You want your parents to be proud of you. You want to pick the right career. You want to like be in a a relationship that like looks good on paper. And it's... What what was the catalyst, I guess? Like what made you decide to like change it all? Was was tarot a part of that decision or was that... I'm just curious what was happening. There were just a lot of different factors. I I realized, you know, I I met my ex-husband... When we were in college, we were 20 when we started dating and we kind of grew up together. and We built this like really cool life. You know, I was like a hairdresser and an artist and we co-owned a food truck and like we did really cool things. We were really involved in the community, but we really at our core wanted such different things. You know, he really wanted to just travel the world. You know, he wanted to be Anthony Bourdain and just travel the world and and, and write about food and all that right. stuff. And I just, I, I wanted to buy a house. I was like, I'm working these two jobs and I, I really want to leave. We were living in Florida. I really want to leave Florida and, you know, find find our home and, and buy a house and, you know, take the next step in life and put some roots down. And And that was just not what he wanted. And we just couldn't we just kept getting further and further and further apart. And I just was like, you know what? We're completely different people. We should, we should move on. Like I want, he wasn't into spirituality and I resented that, you know, it's having, having a a conscious partnership with something that was, I learned into my thirties was extremely important for me. And it was a deal breaker. Yeah. Yeah, I I love that for you, though. Thank you. Yeah. And I also felt like I was a deal breaker for, I was holding him back too, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people grow apart and that's natural. And I, it's not easy to go through it, but like you, you have to be honest with yourself at the end of the day. So back onto tarot, um, I mean, how did you begin to use tarot more? Like, were you using tarot like since you were in your teens or did you kind of like pick it back up since you're going through like a crazy time? I picked it back up since I was going through a crazy time. Um, It it was always something that was present, but it was more like for fun. You know, like I would get together with my little college friends and like do readings for them, you know, over wine or whatever. And it was nothing like crazy serious because I'd never really experienced that moment of just everything like falling apart. Like there were, there was always moments of things, you know, crashing down a little bit, but you know, you write, you write the ship 
And I did that in a way that was, you know, it felt like more capitalism based, you know, and not soul based. And this was the first time where I was like, you know what, that's not worked for me. And now I need to just scrap it all, do something different. I don't know what life is going to look like. I'm very scared. Everything is really uncertain. I have no plans. I have no like deep gut feeling of what the next move is. And I feel like Tara was kind of like holding my hand through it, mm-hmm. you know, kind of talking, yeah. using it to talk to the universe and being like, yeah. I know I've got some spirit guides out there. What do you, <laughs> what do you got for me? What do I need to, where, where should I be putting my energy? Where should I be putting my focus? Cause all of the mm-hmm. things that were happening were so outside of my wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, as you know, I've written several books and created several tarot decks and I've never been a writer. I've never taken a writing class. And all of a sudden when this happened, I started writing every single day for hours and hours and hours. And I was like, where is this coming from? It's so surprising, which I think, you know, how tarot and astrology can both help you discover gifts you didn't know you had because you're looking in the wrong direction for so long. Hey, my loves, just wanted to take a quick break and let you know about my free live new moon ritual event that I'll be hosting on YouTube on March 21st. It'll be the new moon in Aries and the astrological new year. So I'll be hosting a new moon ritual that includes guided meditation, journaling, and intention setting as a group. This will kick off a new community program we're launching called the Dream Life Club. To RSVP for the free event, go to lavendaire.com slash new moon. That's M-E-W-M O-O-N, new moon. Thanks, and I can't wait to see you there. Why don't you give us some examples of how you use tarot as a guide? Because I'm sure people listening, maybe they're also going through like a difficult life moment. So how how is this a tool? Like are what kind of questions do you ask? And how often do you do you work with tarot? Ooh, great questions. Um, I engage with tarot every single day whether it's for myself or for my clients, I was really using it during that dark period of time as shadow work because I knew that I couldn't, obviously, just to preface, we can't make change in our lives doing the same thing that we've always done and reacting. You know, you start noticing patterns in relationships and just the way things activate or trigger you And so I was using tarot to kind of tease out that information, you know, like, what am I not seeing that I keep repeating? Because I don't want to do this ever again. And I would literally sit with my deck every morning. I would make my coffee, get myself situated, you know, light a candle, get my crystals out, set a vibe and, you know, clear the energy in the deck and be like, what aspect of my shadow wants to be addressed today? You know, and I would, when I pull cards, I never look at them immediately. I always leave them face down so that I'm not in analysis before I'm done pulling the card. So I'd say like, what, what aspect of my shadow wants to come through today and and be dealt with? And then I'm like, how can I like work with that best? You know, what am I releasing? And like, how can I have like the most compassion for myself while I'm dealing with this? I was like, pull like, you know, four or five cards. And I would always have a journal because, you know, sometimes you ask so many questions. You're like, oh man, what did I ask? So I would always write them down. (laughs) And it kind of became an accidental way to create your own tarot spreads. So like this stuff was happening and I didn't realize it was happening, but I was creating tarot spreads, asking these like very deep personal development kind of questions. And then I would like turn them over and be like, Oh, and before I would go to the guidebook to see like what the meaning of the card is, I would just be like, what memories does that like bring up for me? You know, what is the color? What colors are on this card? Is the card upside down or right side up? And if it's upside down, how does just the feeling of seeing an upside down card make me feel? Because sometimes that's the message. It's not... Anything other than, oh my God, I'm seeing this card upside down and I'm freaking out. And just like letting your intuition. Yeah, I think that's the part that 
it's, I, I hear that from other tarot readers too. It's like, you have to listen to your intuition first before reading the actual description of the card. Cause you, if there's, that's the wisdom, right? It has to come from you. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, there's so much symbolism in the cards that probably have a message for you also. But I think first and foremost is really like just letting whatever wants to come up when you see it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when the cards are upside down, let's say a character, if the card was right side up, they'd be facing this way. But if it's upside down, they're facing that way. So they're looking at whatever cards and action are happening over here as a, and ignoring what's happening over here. So like, it's like paying attention to those like, <laughs> that's where it gets so um, subjective. And it's, I, I feel like most people like don't have that. They haven't built the intuitive sense to be able to notice all those little details. Right. So I guess what, cause I've, I've been into tarot and astrology too, for a few years, but I still read the, just the guidebook and the descriptions. So my question is like, what is your process of, of learning these symbols so that they make sense to you without having to you know, every time look it up. It's really about repetition and practice. The more you engage with it, the more, the more you, you know, start to bring these things together. Um, the way I teach tarot is I link each of the, the minors to their majors. So let's take like, What's your favorite major? There's so many. I don't know. <laughs> the star? I don't know. All right. Well, I should have prefaced one through 10. Let's say like the hermit, right? The hermit okay. is number nine in the majors. So if you think of one through 10 in the minors, you have ace through 10. And then you have these, you know, major arcana cards. So every nine is a different aspect of the hermit. Oh, I see. Okay. So like, let's say the hermit is major because it has all four elements to create that energy. So like the nine of pentacles is the earth element of the hermit. Oh, so I've it's never easy seen to remember. It. I guess, yeah, I haven't learned tarot that way. That's okay. very interesting. Yeah, like, or the magician, number one. You know, mm -hmm. I think all the aces are the elements on the magician's table. Okay, I see. So it's just like, pure form of that so if you ever get lost or you're like i don't know you'd be like okay it's a nine it's back to the hermit or it's an eight so it's it's connected to strengths or it's a seven like sevens i think people get hung up with and it's like okay that's chariot energy is the underlying thread right Essentially, it's um, learning the foundation of how the tarot deck is constructed and like how things, how the different cards relate to each other. Yeah. And it's, I think like starting with just learning about the majors and learning about the fool's journey as this, you know, character that's embodying these different archetypes as they move forward. And it's, it starts out very personal and then it becomes like more interpersonal. And then it becomes kind of cosmic. Right. Um, I have another question for you. Is like when you go to tarot and you ask a question, how soon do you ask the same question? Or do you never ask the same question again? Because you know how... I think um, we'd all be lying if we said we didn't <laughs> ask the same question over and over again, a hundred different ways. Because we're looking right. for the answer we want. And sometimes, right, sometimes you're like, I don't like that answer. Let me ask it again tomorrow, right? So do you uh -huh. do that? And, and what is, I don't know, what is your advice on that? Oh, or what is your always, perspective, I guess? <laughs> I think a lot of times we go, we turn to tarot when we want it to be a certain thing. And it's just not. And that's usually like, the. I feel like it's the universe saying like, honey, I said what I said. Your intuition, you know better. You're looking for outside validation. And it's just like you need to approach it differently. It's like, okay, what are... I usually go to its opposite. You know, it's like, okay, if I want the answer to be this one thing, what's it, what is the actual answer that I'm not seeing? And how can I like get there in a way that feels good? Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so essentially you're saying like you trust the first thing that you see. Yes. I think that every card you pick has a message for you. I think we get caught up when the message isn't the message that we want. Yeah. <laughs> We're all guilty of it. I, oh my God. I know. <laughs> like sometimes I do the, the spread where it's like this decision or this decision, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you get that tempt, like, oh, let me just do it again. Let me, it's, it's kind of like the eight ball. You're like, you, you shake it and it gives you yes. And you're like, let me shake it again. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you talk about astrology as well. So I want you to tell us a little bit about what's your take on when to use tarot versus when to use astrology. I love this so much and I feel so passionately about it because I think that tarot is so amazing at helping you make decisions, reading the energy, seeing how you, where you are on your path and really helping you like dive deeply into your own personal development and growth. However, it's really awful if you want timing questions answered. And I feel like when I was first starting out in my client work, people would be like, I would be, you know, I would you know, flip the cards and I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, there, there energetically is a relationship available for you. Like, let's dig into how you can become ready to receive that relationship. And then people are like, well, when am I going to meet them? And I'm like, well, ta well, Tarot can't tell you that. And I think it's irresponsible for people to like try to predict that and p predict the future. I think that Tarot is more about developing your intuition. So that's when, again, I mentioned that I started using astrology because I was like, why did my whole life blow up? And then learning, oh, you know what? When certain planets hit these points in your chart, it activates life changes. And I started reading tarot alongside astrology to help people be like, okay, well, here's the best time for getting into a relationship. Here's a great time to leave a relationship or leave a job or start a new career or, you know, have something happening with your health or your family, la, 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 la. Yeah. In the case where you're using both, like which one do you do first? Do you look at astrology and then you like, right? Explain the process a little more. That's great. Um, so I always, let's say that you had booked a reading with me, right? So before we would get on our call, I always ask my tarot deck three questions. And I like to, it's, it's like an icebreaker for me. And also it helps me not feel led by the client's story. So I don't know anything about you. And I, I'll shuffle my deck, you know, I'll drop into my sacred space um, and ask my deck, like, what's happening in your life that we need to discuss today? And then the next question I ask is, what, are, what does the universe and your guides have to say about that first card? And the third question I ask is, how can I be most of service to you during this call? Mm -hmm. And I do that before I look at the chart and I feel led in that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm just see what happens. So when you would get on the call, I would say, Eileen, I pulled some cards to just like, I you see. know, break the ice, a starting point together. So I always start with tarot. Mm -hmm. get a feel of the energy and then you can tell me as much or as little about your situation as you feel comfortable and then I pop open the chart and share the screen and I'm like well here's the areas of life that are being activated right now and how the planets are talking to your natal chart and then you can ask me as many tarot questions or astrology questions and we kind of just go through in that way yeah. Um, it seems like a lot. And I know that listeners who maybe they're beginners, right? So how do you, how would you advise people to start using both of these tools? Because literally, even I've been using them for a few years and it's still, I still feel like a beginner, <laughs> right? That, and that's okay. It's, it's a lot of information. It's not, um, again, I think that when you start a tarot practice, First of all, finding a tarot deck that you really love the artwork and you feel very representative, like represented in. Because there are so many great artist-created decks nowadays that are so much more inclusive than a traditional Rider-Waite-Smith. 
So finding a deck that you really resonate with and, and finding a great book. A lot of times the decks, they come with a tiny little guidebook that gives you like a one word description, which is great to like throw in your purse once you've you know been reading for a while, but like getting a really good, solid foundational book mm-hmm. to work with, but not as like a crutch, you know, right. like if you could just start, start out every day, just pulling one card for yourself. And challenging yourself to not look up the meaning, Mm -hmm. just maybe having your journal out and writing down the things that come to you or asking like the same question every day so that you get in a routine, you know, like, what do I need to know today? What's the energy of today? You know, and then adding a second card in when you feel more comfortable, like, I love the, um, the little two card spread, what should I be approaching today and what should I avoid? Can you give some tips on like how to formulate questions to ask tarot? Because I, I think the power is in qu- the questions. It's kind of like journaling, right? The better the prompt, the better your result. So how, yeah, a- any like do's and don'ts or any tips on questions? So yes and no questions can be tricky because tarot is so subjective. But I think that if you are going to ask yes and no questions, having a conversation with your deck ahead of time and setting some like guide rules of like, okay, if I pull a cups card, it's a yes. If I pull swords, it's a no. I see. Or just listening to your intuition when you see a card and you automatically feel like it's a yes. Or a no, but I try to avoid yes, no, and like really closed questions of like when or how. And I try to keep it more productive. And again, like you said, journal questions, it's like, it's not so cut and dry where you're like, what's going to happen today? And then you see a card with like swords sticking through a heart. (laughs) So then you get freaked out and you're like, oh my God, am I going to get stabbed today? Like, is somebody going to hurt my feelings? Or, you know, it's like kind of like understanding that each card has medicine. It's not like like a sentence, like you're going to get hurt today. It's like, oh, you know what? You might be activated today. Something might remind you of something that hurt you in the past and it's coming up for you to release it and heal it. So a lot of times if I see a card and I ask a question, like what, you know, what energy is coming today? You can always follow that up with, okay, what comes next? How can I handle that best? I see. Right. So it's all about like bringing it back to yourself. Like how can I handle what's coming or what's like, what's the best way forward? Questions like that. Right. Right. Like I really think that tarot is very, very, very self-reflective and less about, again, predicting the future or be trying to gain insight on other people. Like what is this person thinking about me? And you put like... It's going to read your own feelings about it. I see. Yeah. You know, rather than give you like it's, it is a divination tool, but it's, it's really more of a practical tool. How would you describe, like, I'm curious about your personal routines with tarot and astrology. Like, what do you do on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis? Like, what are your rituals? (laughs) That's great. Well, obviously we, um, you know, we, we just went into a new year. So I always start the new year off with a year ahead tarot spread where I'll pull one card to represent the energy of the year. So like your main theme of 2023 and then a card for each of the 12 months. And I don't try to like, you know, future trip on what those cards months down the line have mean because I have no idea how they're going to play out. I literally will just look at February and, you know, card of the year. What's the conversation between those two cards? March. What's the conversation between March and that? And then kind of like looking back and seeing how they build upon each other. 
So that's like the, that's like the year. And I'm curious, since you've probably done it for past years, so how does it rely or align with reality for you? Does it, is it very accurate? Is it, oh yeah. Is it telling you what's going to happen or is it telling you what, you know, what, what information does that give you? Just for, as an example, when I pulled my card of the year for 2021, it was the world. And I was like, oh man, so some endings and beginnings. And that was the year that very soon after um, I ended a relationship and realized that like living in New York was no longer for me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to really have an ending and a new beginning. And it was such a world card and it was a world year. Cool. Or like the year I got divorced or my divorce was finalized, like my card of the year was justice. Mm. So it's just like stuff like that. And it feels very accurate, like with my clients and friends and they're like, yeah, that, that was the card of the year. Wow. And then the cards you pull for each month are kind of like a mini story. But then every day I like to ask like, what is, you know, what energy am I being invited into today? And that is always like on a soul level. And so like the second card would be like, well, how does my ego feel about that? And then there's like action steps, you know, what can I do to support myself at my highest and best? And what can I release? Yeah, th- those, that's deep though. Like you're literally like connecting with your soul every day and like growing every day, <laughs> right? I realized that my, I think my calling is around spiritual self-help. And it's my favorite thing to do. You know, it's those are the types of relationships I have where we really go, we take deep dives into like our trauma and our healing and having this connection to the universe and having a connection to our ourselves and our bodies. And we're always growing and changing. And the more you can lean into uncertainty and the unknown, the more magic you can invite into your life. Definitely. How do you feel this impacts, like, I guess, how you feel about life? Because most people, they go about life and then they get triggered and then it's very difficult and resistant, but you're kind of taking a proactive approach where you're like, (laughs) what's, what's coming today and how do I deal with it? How do I take action? So do you feel like life is more smooth for you or is it still just as difficult? (laughs) I feel like I can recover a lot faster. Okay. Where I I used to let, I mean, I'm a Scorpio moon. I can sit in my salty feelings (laughs) like no other. (laughs) Um, And instead of doing that, I'm like, okay, how can I remove myself from taking this personally and seeing that higher perspective and seeing what the situation is trying to teach me? Because there's so much gold in learning the lessons. It seems to me that you're learning lessons much faster than than someone who wouldn't be doing this tarot practice because it's 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 very proactive. Yes. I just it feels really healthy and it feels good. And it helps me be better with, you know, my clients and my work and I'm just very passionate about it. You mentioned shadow work and it's essentially, it it goes hand in hand with tarot and astrology. So how do you practice shadow work using these tools and how do you recommend like listeners start to, to start to dive into that? So our shadow is, you know, these unclaimed parts of ourselves that we try to hide and ignore and push down. And I think that when you become triggered and you become activated, that is literally the universe poking you in your shadow and it's not trying to ruin your day or make you feel bad about yourself it's trying to say hey this is what wants to be healed this is what wants some attention like bring it out and look at it let it talk to you what is it what does it want to say Mm. and a lot of times when you look at it and you're and you can see it from this non-wounded perspective, you can say, wow, that is actually like a huge gift. I think that um, like something I learned just for me, one of my biggest shadow 
things that I had worked on over the years was jealousy and like FOMO. You know, you see people doing the thing you want to do or having the thing you want. And I would just be so angry and I'll be like, I'm such a good person. Like, why is this, like, why is nothing happening for me? Like, I'm working so hard. Like, why is it just like falling from the sky for this other person? And I didn't realize that like that jealousy was this part of my shadow that was just like, hey, this just just showing you what you want. And so stop wasting your time on the dumb stuff and start putting your energy towards having your own version of that thing that you're, you know, feeling jealous about. Yeah, no, that's so, it's super helpful because we all have things that trigger us. We all have something that, you know, where we can take that higher perspective and do what's productive instead of staying in that negative space. Right. Yeah. Um, and then how do you use tarot and astrology when you're, do you, you know, it, it does it help shine a light on your shadow? Does it, I'm curious about astrology too. Do you like use, take timing into consideration on like when to do shadow work? I think that you can really look in like deeply into your natal chart to look at your path. You can look at how you experienced your parents and where those early wounding experiences happened um, with friendships in childhood, self-esteem. Like that's all there. Yeah. Past life stuff. Like it is yeah. all, it isn't oh, like looking at somebody's natal chart. Like I always feel so um, just grateful that people are sharing, they don't realize like, this is such important information. Like I can see it all. And you're just like, really laying yourself bare. But getting to know your natal chart is seeing like, oh, that's how I experienced my dad. And that's why, you know, our relationship is this way. And this is why now I repeat these patterns in my relationships. So it's like you can really like deeply look into those things to find the patterns. Yeah. Can you tell us what specifically you're looking at? Like say someone has their natal chart. Like are you talking about like Chiron, South Node? Like what are you specifically <laughs> mentioning? Yes. I'm looking at plan I'm looking at Saturn. I'm looking at your moon. I'm looking at you know, what planets are in your fourth house, what planets are making aspects to the angles. Mm. So like things like family, family wounding or trauma, where does that show up? That can show up, I mean, at like different, like Pluto moon aspects are like a lot of mother wounding or like moon Chiron, like squares, oppositions, like tense things or things that fall in your fourth house or near your IC are like, Mm -hmm. you know, Pluto there, Saturn there, having like the big malefics in or Uranus even sometimes in the fourth house can be really disruptive. The signs that fall on those, um, where, where your Chiron is, what sign it's in. I know there's so much. I, I love that. Like, I, I'm sure some people listening can, like, they can understand a little bit, just like I can understand a little bit. But it's, I mean, Google is your best friend. <laughs> just, just dive into learning what these planets and signs mean and start to decode your birth chart. There's so much knowledge. I mean, any tips for how to learn astrology the way that you understand it now? Like, if you were to, I don't know, a fast way to learn it or understand it? I wish there was a fast way. I feel like it. I I studied it for at least three years before I started doing it professionally. And I've been studying it for six years before I wrote my first book about it. (laughs) Cause it's, it's so, it's so much, but learning the energy of the planets first and the signs and kind of like going in that direction so that you're not just giving and and not understanding that people are so much more than their sun sign, right? Mm -hmm. Like what your sun represents in your chart has so little to do with all these other parts of yourself. So understanding, you know, you're start looking at your moon, 
start looking at your ascendant, you know, start looking at Mars and Venus and like taking a deep dive on what signs those are in. And then once you have a good grasp on that, move on to the house that they're in. Because it's like a multi-textural, deeply flavorful meal. Yeah, definitely. Okay, can you also give us your best tips on how to strengthen our intuition? So I love tarot for strengthening your intuition because I think everybody deep down kind of has an, an idea and an inkling and a feeling about things. And you can kind of use tarot to kind of test yourself on that. You know, you can pull a card of like, what does my higher self feel about this situation? And what does my ego want to hear? And taking a look at those cards and journaling about them. And also like taking a moment and pausing. I think also being really patient and pausing before we quickly react to things. And like, what do you really feel? Do you really have the energy to say yes to this? Or will you, you know, want to say no to it later? Stuff like that. So taking a pause, consulting your tarot, it confirms your feelings, especially if you're like, you're feeling like off about something, ask your tarot deck to like, give you some like, are my feelings valid about this? Mm. And then seeing what comes up. And I think that also helps you get to know the difference between your voice of intuition and the voice of fear. I think we say no a lot of times to things because we're afraid, but really that fear is intuitive excitement about doing something new and different and scary versus knowing the like true intuitive feeling of danger. This also brings up another question is I I think some people struggle between knowing whether this is intuition or is this what my mind is telling me, (laughs) right? Some people have a really talkative mind. I, I know I do. So any thoughts on that? I feel like when your mind starts looping and chattering and going on and on and on and you're not getting to any clear message, that's when I, I'm like, okay, thank you, brain. I love you. I'm going to, you're going to sit this one out and go on like, what is my gut feeling telling me? You know, if I did this thing, like, would I feel like happy and joyful? Or would I feel really like overwhelmed, put out? Like, what am I trying to talk myself into or out of? And just bring it back to feelings. Amazing. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your books. So you have the guided tarot books. Tell us about your books and maybe share some like, I guess, starter layouts or, or whatever you'd like to share from that. So the books, the books actually were a very magical story of how they came about. Um, It was like the beginning of 2020 pandemic time. And I had like a full calendar of classes I was going to teach and all these things I was going to do, retreats, la, 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 for my business. And then, you know, lockdown and all of my income disappeared. And because of the work I do, I was not eligible for any unemployment. And I was freaking out like, oh my God, I'm living in New York City. I Rent has to happen. I don't know like what I'm going to do. And I cried for a couple of weeks about it. And then all of a sudden I was like, like had this, you know, intuitive download where it was almost like I heard a voice say, if you, if a client came to you and told you this story, what would you say? And I started laughing and I was like, oh my God, I would tell them that the universe just cleared their space for something else. Mm. I was like, all right, I have no, again, so uncertain into that yeah. void space of I don't know what's coming. And it was like maybe a week or two later when um, an editor at Penguin Random House reached out to me and said, hey, we're looking for a, an author for a tarot book we're putting together. Do you think you have time to write a book for us in eight weeks? Wow. And I'm laughing eight weeks. I'm like, I have, <laughs> I'm like, that's a short period of time, but literally I have nothing else to do. So like, 
please send me a paycheck. And yes, I would love to write this book. And it really is a focus on intuition and build, using tarot not only to learn the foundation of what tarot is and how to do it, but there's so many spreads in there to help you come up and create, like come up with and create your own tarot spreads to build your intuition. There's lots of journal prompts. Like it's very, it's very much how in alignment with how I would read and teach anyway. So we have that. And then we um, adapted it for teens this year and took out like all the stuff about marriage and, you know, career and stuff and made it more like, here's how to deal with like friend stuff and having crushes and dealing with your parents and, you know, having like unfair teachers. So that was really fun. But it's the same thing where we put together like a lot of spreads and how to choose your deck, how to interview your deck, how to treat your deck, um, how to do a reading. I'm still like amazed at the fact that the biggest opportunities just come to you. It's kind of like when it's like when you're not looking for it, but life happens, clears things out, and then it comes. <laughs> it's amazing. And I think like having a trusted tarot practice really helps you figure out these like times of uncertainty and how to chill out and relax. Cause we're always like so quick to go, go, go. And if nothing's happening, feeling in our masculine energy of like, we need to take action now. We need to make something happen. And it's like, actually, you could sit back and be in feminine energy and let something come to you, you know, mm-hmm. give it a container. Yeah. Yeah. Have you looked into your human design? Have you heard of that? Are you a projector? I am not. I'm a generator. Oh, Oh, really? Because I think projector is the type where they have to wait for things to come. Yeah, something like that. They definitely have to be invited in like vampires. (laughs) And whenever I whenever I talk to people, that's also I I always like, you know, I'll throw in a little human design when I do my readings. But projectors there are like, I'm so frustrated. Like I, it's like, put me in the game coach. I know the answer. And I'm like, I know, you know, the answer if you're a projector, but the best way for a projector to kind of get an invitation is to say, Hey, would you be open to my opinion, to my feedback, to my thoughts? And then giving that person the option to be like, Oh yeah, if you have something to say, I'd really like to hear it. And that kind of opens the projector doors. But for generators, it's, we also have to wait to respond to something that really lights us up and excites us. What are you? No, I, I'm a generator as well. So I have a lot of energy if I'm really like passionate or interested in something um, and no energy if I'm not interested, right? Exactly. And, and then the responding part is something that I've also struggled with because I've always wanted to like initiate and start things. But that's something that I... Like I had to become aware of once I learned about human design. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I don't always have to try so hard. I don't always have to be the one initiating. A lot of times I I, I did lo- like an inventory of all the things that I was excited about that I initiated that fell on deaf ears. And I was like, wow, nobody saw me or heard me because nobody asked me for that. Nobody wanted it. And I'm not going to take it personal. I'm just, I'm not doing that anymore. And it it completely changed everything. I think I I started reading human design in 2019. And I was like, I'm going to do a whole year of not initiating and just see what shows up. That was when the book came because I had initiated all of those like courses and retreats. And, and, you know, I was like, I was hustling to try to like build my, you know, build my brand and like grow my business and when I just leave it alone and let it come to me and kind of get over that like fear that nothing's coming, that's when the biggest, most incredible opportunities happen. Wow. I love hearing that. And I'm sure that's reassuring to people listening because it's like you, like learning to trust that sometimes you don't have to try so hard and things will come. The things that are meant for you will come to you eventually. 
in the perf- in the right timing. Right. And that was like a whole thing too of reframing this instead of going out and trying to hustle and chase, being in that space of trust and thinking, oh, my work right now isn't to drum it up. It's going to come. My work is to be ready to receive it. So how can I grow and become the more mature version of myself? Or the person, the expansive person that can handle what that's going to look like and what that thing, you know, that next level, like that glow up, you know, because those things, those opportunities can come and we're not ready for them. And then we like push them away. So I'm like, okay, how can I just focus on being ready so that it'll come quicker? Yeah, love it. Um, Another question I I do want to ask you is, is there a way that you use tarot and astrology that would surprise people? Like, is there anything unexpected? I like to use astrology for looking at future dates, but also like looking at past things. Depending on like, let's say there's something important happening in my life. And I'll think about all the people I know that have had certain things happen to them. And I'll go like look back at their dates and see if there's any like special aspects. Right. Yeah. So I, I like to nerd out like that. Yeah. Or like I, if I I'm watching them. Though. <laughs> I look I think I'm back like, I don't at know like if it's like surprising, but no, but I yeah, some people who don't know astrology, they might be surprised that you can do this. Like you, for example, for me, I can look back at my like difficult years in my life and then now I have this knowledge of astrology and I'm like, "Oh, I see Saturn was like conjunct my sun Venus Mercury at that time. It was so difficult for my life." <laughs> um yeah, basically it gives you so much clarity to like go back and see what was happening on on your birth chart. And like in a really dumb, fun way, like I have another girlfriend who's learning astrology and we, we like to, we like to watch terrible, terrible, like B-list rom-coms on Netflix at like Prime. And then we like to text each other and we're like, what do you think like the main girls like top three are? (laughs) And it's like a good way to like teach yourself what the energy of the signs are by like talking about it in that way. Like it, it's fun and it's silly and it's, it brings some levity because, you know, like I'm sitting here looking at like trauma all day and like, oh, this is why like we have these issues. And so it's, it's also fun to just relax and be like, you think that guy's a Taurus? <laughs> yes. It is fun. And that's why I, I like to follow like astrology meme accounts because they're so funny. <laughs> they just capture the energy of, of like the signs. They remind me, the astrology and meme accounts remind me of like, because astrology is essentially a language, right? Tarot and astrology, they're both like their own language. And so think about like when you're a little kid and you're first learning how to read. (laughs) Yeah. You have these like little like... Picture books. Sight picture books. Yeah. And I was like, oh, astrology meme accounts are like the picture books of learning. Yeah. Astrology. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And they're fun and silly, but like you're also learning. Yes. That's funny. Um, all right, Stephanie, um, what, if, if you had one message that you want to leave the listener with today, um, what would that be? If you're curious about starting to read tarot or starting to read astrology and you feel intimidated by it, don't. It's, there's no right or wrong, especially when you're starting with tarot. Like, just, just start. Like, I think, I feel like I get a lot of messages from people that are like, I bought a deck a year ago and I'm too afraid to open it. Cause I think people are really afraid they're going to receive like bad news. And it's like, no, you're going to open Pandora's box of exploring your, yourself and your emotions and your feelings and, you know, healing and growth. And it's such a beautiful tool and there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Love it. And then lastly, where can we find you online? So I mostly live on Instagram and it's, my handle is at moon void tarot, all one word, no special characters. Those are fake accounts. Please ignore them. Um, or on my website, moonvoidtarot.com. 
I do have a TikTok, but I'm not great with it. <laughs> I saw you post some reels. Yeah, and TikToks. I'm getting there. Getting there, getting there. Um, yeah, because side note, it's amazing to see how much like this space has grown. Like tarot and astrology has grown so much since 2020. And I think TikTok is a big part of it. Yeah, so I, I tried to on Instagram, post a a lot of astrology content, like practical astrology content and post tarot spreads and, you know, just different ways to engage with your practice. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I really enjoyed learning more about tarot and astrology. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.